Hello, I am Christine Reiner. I am the NRCS Urban Ag Project Community Coordinator, or Communications Coordinator. There's a lot of community in communicating. Um, and today with me, I have Megan and Dan from Iron Fox Farms. So I'm very excited to get into it. Um, but can you guys kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan. I, uh, and my name is Dan. And we founded Iron Fox Farm, a nonprofit educational gardening space in Sioux Falls. So we live in Sioux Falls and uh, I'm originally from Brookings, so I haven't gone very far. I don't really have an agriculture background other than picking strawberries at Sanderson Gardens just outside of Brookings. And I've been in Sioux Falls for just over, well, 15 years now, for quite a while. And I am a registered dietitian by trade uh, and work for Dakota Rural Action um, in my full-time role and, and have been in Sioux Falls just, just for since 2019. That's awesome. So um, Dan, I, you know, I never knew that you didn't have you know, the whole certificate. So that makes me so much more excited to get into what you guys have cultivated. But um, before you, we kind of dig into that, I'm kind of wondering, why did you choose Sioux Falls for your project? Was there anything, you know, standing out to you? Or was it just kind of proximity? Well, originally, we had a large garden at Megan's parents uh, outside of Freeman, South Dakota. And that was a lot of traveling every weekend and then not being able to keep up with certain tasks that you need to do to upkeep your growing space. And so it, what we're doing now is mainly out of proximity uh, where we're growing our food and where we're doing our educational gardening is just one block away from where we live. And if that wasn't the case, I'm not sure if we'd be able to do it. It, uh, travel time between Sioux Falls and Freeman, you know, like a lot of other people in the state, you got to plan for that. And we do have a lot of specialty producers who, you know, make the two hour trip or the one and a half hour trip. So I'm excited that, you know, I'm in the community where you got to cultivate this space because I've been out there and it's been, it's so serene. Um, and so can we kind of explain what Iron Fox is and how it came to be what it is today? Sure. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. We have some pictures to kind of help um, tell that story. Um, and hopefully you can see that okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. This is what Iron Fox Farm looked like in the summer of 21. Um, when we meanwhile we're driving an hour to my parents farm to garden and we would walk past and dream about all the things we could do in this space um and it never sold because it is in a floodplain and so we met put in an offer for what we uh, could afford and wrote a cover letter of kind of our vision of what we wanted to do with the space and uh, through some fortuitous connections, uh, they were interested in our offer. And so um, that was in August of 21. And so since that, since we've acquired the land, uh, we've worked to get it rezoned as conservation space. Uh, and that allowed us to, uh, it allows us to grow up to the property line. It originally was zoned as three residential lots. Um, and since we aren't able to build on it anyway, because it's a floodplain, um, then this gives us a little bit more flexibility. The lot itself is just under a full acre. And um, in our time too, we now are recognized as a USDA farm and are a 501c3 registered nonprofit. And for uh, context for all of you for where we're located, we, um, on the left of your screen is Cliff Avenue. And then on the top, that yellow line is 10th Street. So we're kind of tucked in that pocket right along 
you'll see the Big Sioux River and the bike path and then the train, the BNSF Railroad. So we're right along that section. And so zoom in a little bit there. Um, Iron Fox Farm is kind of right in the middle. And uh, if we move the screen of us, then you can see Eugene Field Elementary School is the school that we decided to partner with. Um, when we got the land, we knew we wanted to share it with our community. And so farm to school is something we're interested in. And so we got connected with the elementary school with the principal, Mr. Meese there. And um, just really grateful that he was brave enough to accept our um, our offer. <laughs> and um, that that's the proximity there. And now that is what we are today. Did you have anything to add to what I've been saying? No, and actually this is a Google Earth image that hasn't been updated. So we've actually added some growing space this year and we're growing on anywhere between four and 5,000 square feet. A lot of that, um, at least 1,600 square feet have been planted by Eugene Field students. And so our primary purpose or our mission is to provide an educational gardening space for children and community members to learn about different aspects of urban agriculture. And what we do is go into the school in the spring and we learn about seeds, we learn about spacing, we learn about intercropping, what crops work together, what don't. And then this year we started seeds in the school with the students and put them under grow lights on a shelf in the school so the students had to take care of their soil blocks and they had to water them and then when the time was right they brought those blocks out to transplant into the garden and luckily we had very good success with that um, and <laughs> there's way too many summer squash that are growing now but but that's just fine um, but our what we wanted to do was have those students see what happens from seed to harvest so our first year they put seeds in the ground but then the school year ended and we maybe got a fifth of the families to come out in the summertime to see what was growing but this time around they actually got to put the seeds in the soil and they watched it sprout and they took care of it and watched it grow even more and they transplanted it into the ground and then our hope is this summer that we continue to have families come out and harvest uh, some of the fruits that are coming off their plants. And then in the fall, we have them back out and we do a giant harvest. We try to send every student home with something, you know, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, carrots, whatever, whatever is ready. And finally, we close the season by planting a cover crop with those students. And we talk about how the earth prefers to cover itself. You know, just like we as humans, we, we heal and we, we scab over and you know the earth is going to scab over with unwanted things like weeds if you if you don't help it heal a different way uh, so that's kind of trying to tie our lesson back to who we are as people you know it is somewhat of a metaphor for the earth itself trying to heal itself and cover itself and how we can help the earth do that but also to our benefit the next year um, sowing that cover crop can really help increase your yields but help improve your soil and, and build soil health over time. That is oh, so, yeah. <laughs> just so much in, in just a little bit, like the work that you've put in, the community that you've created. I, I mean, I've, I've worked with children, so it's, you know, it's important that everybody kind of sprouts and everybody gets their own one. You don't want tears. Um, and it's just, it's amazing that you've created space for that. So sorry, I, I keep going. This is just, it's very well, I just inspiring. Wanted, <laughs> I wanted to add that none of this is possible just through Megan and I. It's, it's not just us doing this. It's the teachers, it's the volunteers. We get dozens of volunteers to help in the spring and fall. And managing classrooms of 30 students would not be possible without these people. And their expertise too. You know, I don't have an agricultural background, and some of the master gardeners helped us this year, and and we learned a lot from them, uh, and the community members too, and different organizations that have stepped in to help us. We would not be doing what we're doing now without 
additional people uh, putting forth the effort and getting their hands dirty alongside us. I feel like in any agriculture background, that's true, right? And and when you come into the city, it's kind of more complex because you're like, you have to search for those those neighbors that you can kind of ask for help. Um, but I'm proud of Sioux Falls. Like I've, I've lived here most of my life. Um, and so to just see what's cultivated around who is, is interested in this and, and to know like, I, ha I don't have an agriculture background. Um, you know, I have a marketing background, but I, I believe that the soil and how we leave it for future generations is gonna be the most important thing and, and cultivating um, growing habits and, and just showing that anybody is capable of doing this. And so it's so great that you're instilling that in younger generations and getting the whole family excited. And then, you know, the little ones can teach the older ones who maybe don't have that. Um, so I wanna backtrack a little bit. I have a few questions. When you said you got this plot, um, you put up your own funding. At that time, did you have a 501c3? Did you have to provide all of it out of pocket? Yeah, yep. We, this is a dream that we thought was worth pursuing. And so, yeah, a lot of things at Iron Fox Farm has come out of pocket. And depending on your perspective, maybe, maybe you would think we're foolish for some of those things, but, but in a way we're, we're pursuing our collective dream of what we wanted to do. And we're very lucky to be able to do it so close to home. I, I like that you said that. I'm, I'm an artist by trade. So a lot of people thought that that was silly, you know, putting any effort or energy towards art school. But uh, here I am in the agricultural world. So, you know, if you have a dream, you know how to follow your heart in it. And so that's just, that's amazing. Your tenacity of, of we're gonna put our money here and, and just to see, you know, how much you've created with, you know, kind of bootstrapping what you had to. Um, it's, it just blows my mind. It's so awesome. Cause I've been out there and the space just keeps growing and it's, it's, you know, an, an urban farm, like definition to me. Um, so now after you have become a 501c3, have you been able to get funding from other sources at all? We have uh, been awarded a sustainable community grant from the city. Um, we use that to, uh, to complete a rainwater collection class for the community. That was pretty exciting. Uh, we also were awarded a grant from Whole, Fit, Whole Kids Foundation, um, and that helped support our educate the materials and things needed for the education component um, of our garden this year. And that's been huge for us. Also, um, we did get some funding uh, from NRCS for. Um, a high tunnel construction, um, we unfortunately had to turn it down um, because of current um, barriers with uh, building uh, building code right now, um, which I, we might talk about that um, later on this hour. Um, and then we also applied for a, a grant through the USDA for uh, urban ag uh, innovative production uh, projects, and we have not heard back yet on that one. Fingers crossed, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I I do want to get into kind of what barriers you have run into, and I, when you said that you had to rezone it, what did that process look like? It was actually quite easy. Uh, when we approached planning and zoning, there were a couple individuals there that were very excited about what we had in mind. And they thought that because of the floodplain designation of our space, that rezoning to conservation space would just be, it would make things a lot easier for us to grow on, all the way up to the sidewalk or even on the boulevards, but also just an assurance that we're not really going to be building any we're not going to try to build any large buildings and do a bunch of earthwork and have to meet the federal regulations that FEMA put in place for constructing in a flood zone. So 
they were pretty excited and they they kind of opened some doors for us to make it quite easy and from there we just had to post that and go to a city council meeting and get it approved and i i think if if there are future projects that happen in sioux falls and and if somebody owns the land or maybe an organization owns the land i i don't think the city is going to make it difficult uh, to try to do this i think it's just the willingness to do it and then the people to do it and and this, certain people within the city of Sioux Falls are excited to see projects like this expand. That's great, right? That's really great to hear because there are some cities who, who really could have put up those additional barriers that wouldn't have made sense. And that does happen in some rural communities. But um, it's it's great to know that that process is, is kind of straightforward. Um, there are multiple steps. Yes, you have to go and, and get city council approval and, and fill in forms and stuff like that but um have you had any issues with flooding or are you planting kind of some native species to help soak up that extra moisture since we have had the property we haven't had any flood concern uh per neighbors that have been around uh since the 60s uh it, the parts of the land i do think were uh under water um if you can still see the screen the part next to the train is um quite low compared to the rest of it and so in that section we um have some cardboard and pallets laid out there um so we're going to try and build uh, native grasses prairie uh there um for pollinators but also uh, to kind of build soil um under the circumstances what I, I like to tell people when they come out and I point out the railroad and the bike trail and the river, is I say, we have a neighbor here that's been here since the early 60s. And he said, and I remember it's 1968 or 1969, he said there was a very big flood. And none of the trees that are all, I should say, all of the trees that border the railroad were not present before that flood. So that flood had actually planted all those trees or brought the seeds up that far. And then when you look at those trees, they're very well established and old and big, and and I think that's kind of cool to think about. And it's not cool to think about if that were to happen again. And but we're of the mindset that yes, we're in a floodplain. There's going to be bigger worries for us if we do have a flood like that. Uh, if we lose some vegetables along the way, that's that's okay. There'll be another year. Good point. That's kind of the mentality we have to have. Um, I really liked your example of like the earth healing itself. And so it brought in basically its own tree line of like, this is where this needs to be. Mm. So that's very cool. Um, you guys have a lot of stuff out there and I know you partner with several different organizations, like you said, like, um, I think it would be cool if we could get into maybe, um, what's your day look like when you start out in the garden? Yeah, we try to get at it early, especially this May and June, especially have been extremely warm. And so working in the morning has been very important to get out there and, and get things done as soon as possible. We some funding that we didn't mention was we have kind of a big CSA share with mm -hmm. fair market grocery this year. So we're we're piloting a distribution program where last year we had so many excess vegetables, we did not know what to do with them. And now any excess that students aren't taking or families aren't taking, they're going to the fair market and the fair market is selling it at a reduced price. Uh, but it's a pilot program to see, they, they funded us a certain amount and they wanna see how much they can sell throughout the summer and whether or not it's financially viable for them to continue to do that. Uh, and then maybe expand beyond us being the only producer for them. And so a lot of our day, going back to what our day looks like um, a lot of our day when we get out there is turning on the irrigation and assessing the soil moisture but then also assessing what's ready to pick and and harvesting we have a two harvest days a week for fair market we have some additional help uh, one other person one of our very good friends is a part-time gardener with us and we have some small projects here and there that we're taking on but primarily it's it's harvesting and weeding and trying to stay on top of 
of everything else that's growing that we don't really want there. And now that we're almost into July, we're, we're getting behind and it's, it, it's always going to be there and we're committed to not using any sort of chemicals on our produce whatsoever. So it's a lot of hand weeding and a little bit of hoeing here and there. Uh, and then in the afternoon, Megan, Megan has a full-time job. I do too, but I'm an instructor. So I'm fortunate enough to have my summers off. And so Megan often has a lot of work that she has to do in the mornings, afternoons, even in the evenings sometimes. So in the afternoon, we take some time off, have a siesta, uh, get some other life things done that need to get done. And then we're back out there in the evening, usually after five or 6 p.m. until sundown. Uh, and then we've got some chickens, so we usually got to shut them up uh, as the sun goes down. And yeah, I... <laughs> I never thought I would be so antsy to get home all the time. It's hard for me to go out or it's hard for me to be away from our place for too long because I, I think about number one, all the things that need to get done. And then number two, there's just any farmer would know that um, you care about your space and and you want everything to be safe and shut in at the end of the day. And so it, it preoccupies my mind probably more than it should. And I think even more so being in the middle of a city where there are, there are a lot of community members that see what you're doing and you want it to look beautiful and you want it to look presentable because you want, you, I, I want to be proud of it, but I also want my community be, to be proud of it. Um, so investing a lot of times in those, you could say vain, I guess, in the beautification of, of what we're trying to do, but we really want to, we want to make it a beautiful space for everyone that comes there. And we want our neighbors to be proud of it. I think you've already succeeded. Um, I haven't been out there this season yet, but I'm excited to get out there. Um, and, you know, I, I did not know you guys had chickens. That's a new addition to the farm this year. I don't think I have any pictures on the slides I made, but uh, we got the chickens from a friend of ours, uh, the construction management uh, instructor actually at Southeast Tech uh, had gotten the chicken started uh, with their family, but then found out that, like you mentioned, rural communities sometimes have stricter guidelines. Uh, so chickens aren't allowed in crooks. And so we got them for the summer. And so it's been, it's been really fun uh, to have them. Chickens are uh, hilarious. And then um, it's brought its own uh, challenges too. Um, we had a uh, neighbor's dog get out a few times. So it quickly found the chickens and um, it caught one of them. And it was kind of a scary day. Um, the chickens scattered um, and we couldn't find the third one all day. Um, but as chickens do, they come home to roost. So the two made it back and the third one was just nearby. Um, so we found it and uh, immediately called our friend um, Stephanie Peterson with Fruit of the Coop uh, for guidance on how to handle um, the injured bird. She just had one wound underneath her wing. Um, and so then we cared for that, cleaned it up, and she's doing just fine now. And um, and the, the um, neighbors have a shot collar for their dog now, so we haven't had any issues since then. Um, but it also brought up uh, a good opportunity for us to get to know that neighbor better and build that relationship. Um, and Dan was really, has been really good about um, being patient. Uh, we've both been trying to build relationships with our community uh, through our project. And so though it was kind of a scary, frustrating situation, uh, I would say good has come of it. And and now the, the chickens are a little skittish, but uh, we'll um keep working on on that i would so say life experience for them huh? <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would say in terms of life experience as a human that having anything urban is you're going to require some patience and you're going to require some letting go and when i think about letting go in terms of we have third and fourth graders that are planting things it may not be perfect and we have to be okay with that 
uh, we're not going to be there all the time and we're surrounded by hundreds of people. Something could happen that that we don't like or we're not happy with, but it, it, it's a circumstance of where we are and what we're doing. So I try not to get too worked up. So yeah, we had a bird that got hurt, but here is a neighbor that I haven't met yet and who isn't really well connected to the community. Well, here's an opportunity, even though it's not the best one, here's an opportunity for me to show some grace and to try to establish a relationship with that community member. And to me, I had to step back and think about it before doing that because my first reaction was anger. And it, you can't always have that. And if you want to be successful and you want to have community buy-in and you want to get to know your neighbors, which is a lot harder to do, it seems nowadays than it used to be, you got to have that patience and you got to have that ability to step back and look at the larger picture and what is more important here. I mean, yes, I care about my bird, but but really I care about this person more and that we know each other and we have a face-to-face -face good relationship because we're living right next to each other and that's not going to change. It's not going to change for us, definitely. We're not going anywhere. It's, um, it's important to, uh, you know, living in the city, you're, like you said, you're right next to people and sometimes you don't know them very well. And I had a similar issue with my neighbor. Um, their dog uh, got out and, and we had a storm blow down the fence and they actually kind of got after our dog um and so uh, everybody was fine but that was actually how we connected and so like we exchanged information you know and some people in that situation aren't as um um positive and like apologizing about the situation so i'm glad that you had that positive spin on that because if you have a neighbor who is upset about what you're trying to cultivate and make it makes it a lot harder for the community space around you um, and so I'm, I just love how positive you guys are because I, I understand how frustrating it is, you know, when a pet, um, not only gets injured, but is, was just living its life in its own space. Um, so do you let them kind of free range or are they enclosed now? We did have them just wandering around, but now we have them more in an enclosed rain, uh, run. Um, underneath our our tool shed actually which is probably for the best anyway since we're right along the river there's bigger birds out there and raccoons and possums and who knows in the tree line so they're safer this way it's it's all about patience kind of like you said Dan like farming and anything you learn as you go and everything changes um do you plan to do anything with you know the eggs or um are you keeping them as pets? Are they going to be processed? Kind of what's your idea for them? Well, I'm hoping my friend is able to take them back at the end of the summer. He lives in Crooks and believe it or not, uh, Crooks has an ordinance that you can't have chickens. So I, he's working on trying to get that changed or trying to figure out an alternative place for the chickens, but they haven't laid eggs yet. They're not quite old enough. And if they do, we'll eat them or we'll give a couple dozen to him if they start laying that much. Uh, but I don't think, I don't think he has any intention of, of butchering or anything like that until they've lived a, a good long life. Um, and I don't think his daughter would be very happy with that either. She's the one that raised them from chicks. So that's like um, the hardest part for me. I, my dream is to have chickens. And so um, my partner Damon was like, well, we need space. We need, you know, more, more land because we have two dogs and so I'm like I want chicken so bad um but I also really enjoy eating chicken and so like my my mental state is I have to separate that and then I'm like I could never butcher something that I raise unless like you know end of life life cycle we respect that but you know I until I'm in that situation I don't know if I I could I could really speak to it right now <laughs> Um, but that's really amazing that you, you're kind of fostering for them right now. Um, do you think after they potentially take them back, you, you would get some, some full-time chickens for your area? I know Megan wants to, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sold yet. They're so fun to watch. I think they'd be with it. <laughs> Do you use their compost? Because you have a um, a partnership with 
605 compost? Sodak compost. Sodak mm -hmm. compost. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, as far as the chicken manure, it's going wherever it is that we don't like capture it or anything. Um, but the bins on the bottom of the screen um, here are the Sodak 350 compost bins. Sodak compost. What did I say? Oh, so, so, excuse me, Sodak compost. Um, and that's been an excellent partnership. Uh, Deirdre has been uh, really great. The timing of our uh, beginning with Iron Fox Farm and her dream of this um, community compost program timed out really well. And we've been really, really uh, grateful for that partnership. And so uh, community members pay a subscription basically to be able to drop off their food scraps every week. And then Deirdre and her uh, staff turn it. And um, then there's different volunteer days where people can come and help sift the compost and take from their food scraps that have turned into soil. That's really neat. That is, I have my own little garden back there and I've, I've been like, I don't wanna order from Amazon. I don't wanna get worm cash. I don't wanna do all this stuff, you know? So I've got a little makeshift compost, but um, that's really a great partnership because not only can, you know, you talk about the soil health and regenerating that, it's right there on your land. And so all those people who have their subscriptions can also see what you're doing and creating. And I don't know if we mentioned, but it's it's free to harvest on your land, um, right? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah, anything that's available there uh, during our open house hours is is free to go. That's I, we do have with the the partnership for the fair market. We do have an order to fill, so to say. Um, so most of the produce is going to the fair market, but um, yeah, in our open house hours, it's for for the people. Yeah, when are your open hours? If anybody wants this to see it. Yeah, this year we're trying um, one every week, um, alternate days. So uh, this coming Sunday, it will be in the Sunday evening, 5 to 8 p.m. And then the next week is Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. And vice versa. If you follow us on Instagram, then uh, you can, we, we post about when those those are or you can contact us too if you'd like to get um if if those times don't work for you we'd be happy to make another time uh for you to come see what we have going on for those wondering a good um way to contact them is their website and we will actually put that in the comments here in a little bit um for you to have and we'll also tag their instagram so if you want to follow along with the farm and see how how it flourishes um, and volunteer opportunities if you're interested in just going on during their open hours. It's a very cool spot and it's it's even nicer to chat with both of you because you're so down to earth and you're you're so happy to answer questions. I feel like sometimes I've asked some silly questions because farm farming is is not in, in my family um, and there's a lot that goes into it that I did not expect. So um, to be able to go on site and interact with that, it really was very eye-opening. Um, and so uh, my next question is, you have this new partnership with Fair Market. Have you had to increase certain amounts of produce? And can you kind of tell us what your planting layout looks like? Mm -hmm. Can I go forward in the slide? I'll go forward in the slide. We have some quite pictures of um, where we are now. So with the fair market, we tried to come up with a list uh, early, very early in the year of some staple items that they would like to have, and then maybe some other specialty items. And we... <laughs> It's it's difficult to to plan timing wise and to have something consistently all the time. And that's kind of the beauty of our distribution agreement is whatever is ready is what we are bringing there. And so there's no expectation that 
we have peas from June through October. Uh, it's just that when the peas are ready, the peas are ready and we bring those things. Um, um, the bulk of what's going there actually is what the students planted because each classroom planted 30 different transplants of a, a certain thing. So there's summer squash, there's zucchini, there's cucumbers, there's beets, there's peas, carrots, uh, kale, other leafy greens and things like that. And now the trick is one that we're in six weeks into the growing season, more or less, is when we start thinking about some of those plants that are going to retire and that we're going to take them out of production, like spinach, for instance, uh, we probably picked our last spinach today. So what are we going to plant there next um, to try to keep filling those coolers at Fair Market to keep offering a variety of vegetables to the customers there? And so I, I fully recognize that anyone that's running the CSA uh, is doing some, some pretty difficult work and meticulous planning of trying to figure out how they can fill their boxes with a variety and the diversity of, of vegetables and to keep their customers happy and to have enough of it at the same time. So we're really fortunate that we are allowed to stumble in this process of trying to figure out how to get as much as we can there, um, but also maintain that variety. We also have a additional contributor with Augustana University. So if, if you're not familiar, but with Augustana University's garden, they, they have a student garden and they have international students that are working there throughout the summer. Then um, they've got, they do a CSA very small for some faculty members and, and people around campus, uh, but they're also contributing some of their excess vegetables to fair market. And they're part of the, the partnership that we have with them. And their space is also uh, really well curated. They're growing a lot of food on um, pretty intensively on their space. I didn't know Augustana was doing all that. That's amazing. That's really mm -hmm. I think it's been going on for a long time and it even was originally going into their meals, right? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I, I think once I'm done talking to you, I'm going to kind of look up how much space they have and, and what they're growing. Um, have you run into kind of issues of, say, pests or, you know, just stuff not planting properly? Do you kind of have any stories you want to share? This year, uh, coming going from our first garden together at my parents' farm, where you only get to go once a week, uh, the pests and weeds are impossible to manage. Um, this year, I feel like we've been able to stay, um, Dan thinks we're behind, but I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Weeds are the biggest problem for us, um, bind weed in particular, or creeping jenny, some call it. Uh, it just is impossible to get rid of. Um, and so that's been kind of an incessant battle as far as um, pests go, rabbits is the other main pest that we have. As I'm sure most of you uh, saw or experienced, the rabbits did detriment, like severe damage to all sorts of shrubs and fruit trees around Sioux Falls. And our fruit trees were no exemption. Uh, so we had protection, but the rabbits ate the next 12 inches. And so we thought they were all lost, um, but um, they are sprouting again. Um, and so we still will have some, some fruit trees. We have four apple and two cherry. We took out three trees because we thought they weren't gonna make it and we needed more uh, space to grow vegetables on. Um, but so that's been, uh, kind of a constant pest. We did see a deer also nearby today. Yeah, for any urban growers that are really frustrated about rabbits, I would highly recommend this. This is not allowed in the city. However, if nobody complains about it, you can do it. And we use an electric fence with a solar uh, energizer or a battery. And that really has significantly decreased uh, any rabbit infiltration into our growing space. Uh, you'd have to be able to stomach the cost too. You know, it's it's not cheap, but this is our second season using the fence and I think it's gonna last a really long time. 
and I'm really happy with its performance of keeping that particular pest out. If you're going to grow in an urban setting, you're going to have rabbits and <laughs> and they can mow it down fast mm -hmm. if you don't have it protected. I I have a, a backyard garden and I saw four today, so you're not joking there. Um, is the fence in these photos? Is that? Um, that's that's right. Yeah, it's a 30 inch fence. So a lot of your practices, it seems like they're all sustainable and they're all kind of you know, good for the environment. You have your rainwater collection, you have solar. Um, can we kind of get into your practices of like where you started and, and maybe like what you've learned? Um, I know there's, there's a lot to cover. We can talk about irrigation or um, even your rainwater collecting. That's fascinating to me because I thought that was illegal here in Sioux Falls. No, yeah well. yeah as far as i know it's not the the city funded us to put a class on about it so <laughs> yeah no i'm i'm taking my information from you so like just just the myth like i've been carrying around in my head i was like oh why can't i do that which is so silly um but yeah that class i i am sad i missed it i would have really benefited for for rainwater collection so last year we didn't have any sort of water hookup and we were thinking about do we do a well do we hook up to municipal water and we just kind of dealt with it last summer we knew that we were going to have to be filling tanks and hand watering and, and that took a lot of time uh, but last year we collected enough rainwater to get us through june and i thought that was pretty impressive i don't think we would have been able to say the same about this season because we've just been so short of rain uh, but i think rainwater collection is something that anybody can do if you have a 33 gallon barrel 55 gallon barrel or if you have a bigger tank and you have something to collect off of where we have an oversized garage but you get about six tenths of a gallon per square foot per inch of water and it adds up pretty quick the one thing that i would say uh, without getting too into the weeds is that collecting off your house may or may not be a good idea just because of asphalt shingles uh, if you have a tin roof or you have a tin roof shed or something like that, that may be a better uh, location to be collecting that rainwater off of. Uh, anecdotally, Megan's cousins are market gardeners uh, out near Freeman, uh, Prairie Roots Produce, Prairie Roots Farm. And they say with their well water that it's highly mineralized and they get lots of salts and different things and they're salting the soil, which isn't great. And so they're even thinking about collecting rainwater off of some of their bigger structures because rainwater just has naturally has those things that kind of cleanse out the soil or rinse out the soil that maybe well water or city water doesn't have. So I don't know. I think it's good for the plants and I, I think it's beneficial overall. It does take a little bit of installation work and maybe a little bit of curating in the spring and fall. But after that, it's it's pretty easy. Better than and we hope to... carrying water, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and we hope to do a community education class on rainwater, uh, like annually. So you haven't missed out for, for sure. Good, good, good. I'm like, maybe we might connect after this and, and see if we can host one and, and have some spot people there. Because that is, I think, something, it's a resource that is naturally occurring and um, city water to me, I, I don't personally drink it. Um, and so I think that it would kind of, you know, be a little healthier for plants if we're just grabbing and collecting the natural runoff of what would just get wasted anyway. Um, so when you set up your irrigation, was that, was that something simple to do or with how large, um, of operation you have so far, was it kind of tricky? It was another example of uh, in, uh, financial input right away. Um, that was kind of hard to swallow, but we knew that we wanted to expand our growing uh, substantially and we weren't gonna be able to water by hand. So we um, we already had a hookup on the lot. There used to be houses on the property about eight years ago. Um, so then we had to get an excavator um, come and dig a line for us 
Um, since we're in the floodplain, we needed a flood resistant box for our water meter. And so had to order that. And then um, also then all of the irrigation supplies for the drip. And um, we do have two farmer spigots now on the property um, and it's all zoned into different um, watering sections basically. Um, and it saved us hours of time, hours and hours and hours of time, mostly Daniel. <laughs> yeah, setting that stuff up, I've, I've had mentors to, to help me with figuring out different types of plumbing and different configurations and what you need. Uh, but setting that stuff up is not super difficult. And if you're a little bit scrappy and you can look through some different supply catalogs, you could probably put together your own uh, drip irrigation system just off the, the faucet off your house. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it saves a lot of time. There's if you have if you're growing over 200 square feet, that's a lot to water every other day, every day. I was going to say uh, in terms of trying to be sustainable or environmentally friendly. One thing that we really try to do is cover the ground that we're not growing on, whether or not that's with wood chips or with some type of mulch, you know, grass clippings or straw. We primarily go with straw just because we had a good supply of it this year, uh, but covering that soil so it's not getting baked by the sun. Uh, there's in Acres USA, they had an article just last month about soil temperatures and uncovered soils can get up to 160, 170 degrees surface temp. But if you have it mulched with something, uh, it rarely gets over 100 degrees. And so it's just overall better for the microorganisms that are there. It's good weed suppression. It breaks down. It feeds the soil over time. Um, it's easier to, to be on your knees and go around and weed. Uh, it's it, And water retention. That would probably be a really big thing. If we get a rain, everything that has straw mulch around it, we usually don't have to water for another three or four days after that. Um, I would I would highlight that that if you're not if you're not doing that now in your garden, I would consider doing it. it I think it will you'll reap benefits in the long term. I um I just, it just blows my mind that you guys this is just your dream and your hobby and this different thing full-time gigs because you know I go to YouTube University um for my plant education and I follow a, a guy in Australia I don't know if you watch Sustainable Me if you've heard of him I have it he he's a very fun guy to watch um and he he kind of just goes through all these different things of like trying and experimenting and I I feel like your project would be something that would interest people so much like you should have your own youtube channel where you kind of go through these things and and i don't know how comfortable you are in front of the camera or not but um just like showing hey it doesn't have to be aesthetically pleasing you don't have to spend all of your money and you can do very simple tricks um but i connected that because i need to mulch my garden and that's probably my number one issue right now with everything besides the weeding and the bunnies um, but it's, it's a very simple step. And like you said, I mean, 70 degrees, that's a huge difference on, on your soil quality. Um, so Dan, I don't know, Dan, Megan, you guys could have, you know, your own YouTube class. <laughs> um, and I would subscribe. I, I am very interested. I, I really enjoy talking about just your practices and what you've done and, and I like how honest you're being about, hey, we've had to spend a few chunks of money, but in that long run, it's worth it. Um, and sometimes that can steer people away. I mean, urban gardening, you, you've got to think about these things. Water, where you're going to get this? Do you have the time to carry the water to and from your house, you know? Um, so it sounds like you guys have definitely had quite the journey in that and, and you just are so knowledgeable. So I, I just, if I don't thank you later, I just want to thank you again for sharing all this insight because I think it's really important for people to see and to get inspired um, and just to visit this plot because it's remarkable in person. Like I, I just, I love going there. Um, so with how much money you've had to spend though, 
as you've kind of worked with the city, have they helped alleviate that in, in certain programs, donations, or any sort of, um, you know, trades? Uh, I wish I could say yes. There have been, when we rezoned, that fee was waived, and that was very generous. Um, we had a little mishap with our water meter and had the wrong valve, and we got the right valve without any additional charge, and that was very nice. Um, hold on one moment. Megan can keep talking. Someone is at the door. Um, uh, about the city thing. Well, yeah, but it, it, um, so the community, it seems like the community has been kind of a, a good resource. Have you worked with certain programs or partnerships? Um, I know the city kind of can only do so much. Um, but is there like another organization that you you found helped you along the way? Hmm. Uh, initially, when we had first started, Dakota Rural Action had invited us to uh, one of their uh, monthly meetings um, in the homegrown chapter, which was super fortuitous. That's when we got connected with Deirdre Appel of Sodak Compost and also got connected just to a community of um, interested and engaged folks in Sioux Falls. Um, through the year, now I'm actually um, on staff with the Code Rural Action too, and now I'm excited to help people um, build those kinds of relationships for themselves uh, as it was super beneficial for us. Um, so that's been one for sure, um, especially producers, you have some great material. So we're really happy uh, to be able to share in that with you all um, as well. Yeah, our our urban egg project um, is pretty recent. So we are we are working behind the scenes to to bring more education. That's kind of our, our first goal is to share um, what people like you are doing and say, hey, this is kind of how you can get started or or what's possible. Um, do you do you think that with your project, um, the results of it could help in further city planning or policy from maybe local, state, or even national levels? Yes, I definitely think so. Uh, for Sioux Falls in particular, um, as it's continually expanding um, in urban sprawl, it's taking up a lot of uh, historically ag production land. And so it's something that uh, we think about a lot of as this ag land is taken out of production, how can we as the city plan uh, for spaces that can still grow food, um, especially as uh, food insecurity continues to be a, an issue in the city. Um, and then on the school board, side or school side just to support farm to school efforts um, is important to yeah the difficult or the barrier I foresee in any of of that is you got to have somebody or some bodies that are willing to take on the the work especially if it's going to be a bigger project and so we have some aspirations of trying to work a little more closely with the school district and maybe establishing some growing spaces at some Title I schools that could maybe benefit from growing their own food and having that available to those families. Uh, but it's a matter of, do we have the people that are able to, to tend to those and make sure that they're successful? And we're very fortunate that Megan has some flexibility with her work and that that I have, I'm afforded the time off to, to make Iron Fox work. Uh, but if, if it's gonna happen anywhere else, um, you got to find the right people or or you have to fund those positions and and you know if if we if we could make the decisions it would be great to have a, a city uh, garden coordinator or urban agriculture coordinator or for the school district to do something like that um, but right now those those are the the things that maybe we can influence but not the things we can make the decisions on it's it takes a lot of work and a lot of people to show up and and sometimes you know there are people who want to do the work but they can't show up 
Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you touched upon that because our food deserts are becoming more of a worry here and, and you know, fair market, I think has helped combat that a little bit. So to see how it's connected from market to producer to idea, um, it's been really nice because there are options, but for a time people didn't have that resource and they were having to travel, you know, further outside of their zones. And some people can't do that with transportation. Um, and so food insecurity is, is really important. And so how many, how many kids do you usually have in a group or like help harvest and, and plant total? There are about 140 students that we work with between the third and fourth graders at Eugene Field. At a time, um, just, I mean, 30 would be the most at a time. And even that is a lot at a time. That's, that takes, like you said, some bodies, bodies of people to make sure that, hey, you know, everybody's kind of doing what they, they should be doing and kids just get very excited. Um, and when they're outside and, and out there, you know, you, you have to focus on a lot of things. So I think it's just amazing that you dedicate your time to this and you, you are enriching the community you're around and inspiring people, countless people, you know, at this point, especially starting from younger generations, that's going to be a huge impact on our city, I believe. Um, I, I guess I can't believe we're already almost at our time limit. Um, it's just been so delightful talking to you and, and picking your brain about things. Um, but if you had kind of in a dream world, if you had unlimited funding, what would you do with it? Um, I guess, do you have an answer? Uh, I, I would try to distribute that in a way that would empower other people to do something similar and maybe not on the same scale but something similar uh, in their own communities finding green space that is being unused or finding like a school that has a large swath of green that is important for playground to have that still but to to just empower others to do do this type of stuff and to I don't know if compensates is the right word, but to incentivize uh, growing a green space and providing food for your, your immediate community. And I, th I just, I feel like you can build a lot of relationships that way. You can build health that way too. Uh, but I think the face-to-face -face and the having it as an example or having it as a a pinpoint in the neighborhood or something that people can go to you know I think about our neighborhood all the time and the people that walk by almost every day and yes we're having a two to five minute conversation and that's awesome because I'm getting to know them a little bit more every time and and, and I know that they like walking by there and so if every neighbor could neighborhood could have something like that it doesn't necessarily even have to be a garden per se it could be a flower garden it could be a pollinator plot uh but if I had endless funding, I would try to find a way to empower others to that wanted to to do something like this. That's a really great answer. Um, I mean, mental health. Uh, I go to my garden for mental health, and so just to see something positive like that, that would boost people. And maybe it's that little jolt of sunshine they need. Um, and so I don't want to go over our time, but I've got one more question for you. Um, what? Uh, oh, where did it go? Okay. So do you have any advice for somebody who's, who wants to start or who maybe has a little bit of knowledge, but they're just getting going? I, the only, the best way to learn for gardening for us has been to do it. Um, so there's, you can often come up with a bunch of excuses for not to start something, uh, but there are, um, all sorts of resources in Sioux Falls we have all sorts of resources Dan have, and I have had a lot of uh, mentor figures in gardening um, 
ourselves and um so get connected to um to those networks but also um don't be afraid about if your plant doesn't make it that happens to us too um just uh that's the beauty of gardening is that we're all learning and it's our own little science projects uh for our our own uh nourishment yeah i would echo what megan has to say is there are many many resources whether it be nrcs the sdsu extension master gardeners and the list goes on and then we have a lot of local producers around here too that are near sioux falls or maybe a little bit further and it's a, a close-knit group of people that are willing to help and share their knowledge. I mean, a lot of, I, I will never say that I know it all and I'm going to learn something every single day and I'm going to have to call people to consult with them and ask them. And and I, what we've learned so far has come from other minds and books and YouTube channels and, and all those sorts of things. So be hungry for that knowledge, but don't don't be afraid to ask for it either because I think people here in this area are willing to share it and they want to see you succeed. Uh, the one thing that I wish we maybe would have done would have been to wait one year before we started a project uh, as large as what we have now. Uh, I, I think there would have been a benefit to trying to envision a little bit more, but it's really hard to wait. It's hard to be patient. And now that we've kind of established the set growing space that we have, I think we can be a little bit more intentional about how we develop that in the future. But if you have the opportunity to wait and you and you can be patient and and just sit with your land and sit with that space for a little bit, uh, I, I think you might come out a little better or at least a little less stressed than than what we were in the, the beginnings. Yeah, that's really good advice. That's very good advice. I'm a, I'm one of those persons who like I, I list all my seeds um and then like I kind of go crazy planting and I'm like I should not have done all of that <laughs> um I want to thank you guys for both being here today it's been such a great amazing conversation and for our listeners if you have any questions you can add them in the comments um I've tagged their website there so you can even contact them directly you could apply to be a volunteer you can check out their space um, and follow their Instagram to see kind of when they're open um, and when to visit. Um, a very exciting thing that we haven't announced yet is SD Specialty Producers is going to partner with Iron Fox Farm and host a fun little um, urban egg day on August 4th. So if you have you know, your calendar up, we will be sharing that event soon. And we can't wait to actually be on site with you. It's so exciting. Um, but I want to thank you both for being here today, and I'll let you get going. Um, but really, what you've cultivated is is so amazing, and and you can just tell talking to you that you've touched so many lives, and and showing them that have grace in what you're doing. You know, when you grow in the garden, it's not going to look like the supermarket, and that's good. That's okay. Um, so just thank you both so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for your time, and thank you all that took time to listen to us. <laughs>